let us now begin off with few theory and formulas related to work power energy law of conservation of energy momentum okay so my first point would be work okay the work done by a force is given as f vector dotted with s vector okay since it is dot product of two vectors which implies work is a vector scalar quantity fine now for a variable force i'll write total work as integral of f vector dotted with ds vector okay this is for variable force okay another thing which i need to mention about work is that work done by a conservative force is dependent only on the initial state and final state of the body fine now the definition could be vice versa we can define a conservative force as that force for which the work done is dependent only on the initial state and the final state of the body fine and uh, all forces which follow the inverse square law that is the force whose magnitude is dependent upon the inverse of the square of the distance from a particular point are conservative forces fine so basically conservative forces are the central uh, spherically symmetric central forces all spherically sym symmetric central forces are conservative in nature okay now what is a central force a central force is a force which is directed towards the center okay it is directed towards a particular point fine and it acts on a body and its magnitude is dependent on the distance of the body from that particular point okay so in this case the distance is x so it it is going to be a function of x fine okay now by spherical symmetry i mean that at any particular distance the magnitude of force must be same such a force would be called a spherically symmetric force and if it is dependent on x that is if it is a function of x then we will call it a central force fine so all spherically symmetric central forces are conservative in nature fine okay let us now move on to power it is nothing else but rate of doing work okay average power is given by del w upon del t where del w is the small amount of work done on a body and del t is the small time for which the work is being done instantaneous power is defined as dw upon dt okay let us now move on to energy
defined as the capacity to do work there are two kinds of energies one is potential energy the second one is kinetic energy the potential energy is stored due to the virtue of position of a body potential energy stored due to virtue of position of a body okay and kinetic energy it is stored due to virtue of motion fine so if i have a body which is of mass m and it is moving at a velocity v the kinetic energy of this body would be given by half mv square okay fine now let us move on to a theorem which is called work energy theorem okay work energy theorem states that the net work done by all the forces on a system is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of the system mathematically i'll write del w equals delta ke where delta ke is the change in the kinetic energy of the system and del w is the amount of work done by all the external forces all the forces on the system okay this is the basic definition of work energy theorem okay now the law of conservation of mechanical energy is basically a special case of work energy theorem work energy theorem works in case of conservative as well as non conservative forces but law of conservation of mechanical energy works only for the conservative forces so law of conservation of mechanical energy okay so it states that the sum total of the kinetic energy and potential energy remains the same in a system at any instance of time when it is subjected to conservative forces only okay when a system is subjected to conservative forces only then the sum total of the kinetic energy and potential energy of the system is constant so this is my law of conservation of mechanical energy actually it is a special case of work energy theorem this conservation of mechanical energy theorem is a special case
of work energy theorem okay work energy theorem works for all types of forces that is conservative as well as non conservative okay fine let us now begin off with another topic that is linear momentum and its conservation principle linear momentum so if i have a body of mass m and let's say it has a velocity v so the linear momentum is defined as p it is given by m into v vector okay this is basically the mathematical definition of a physical quantity linear momentum okay now if i have a system of particles and there is no external force which is being applied on the system so if i have a system of particles let's say these three particles this is my system and there are no external forces on this system as a whole there may be internal forces existing between any possible combination of these two or these three particles okay so in that case the total momentum of the system is conserved so the law of conservation of linear momentum states that linear momentum states that if a system is under no external force then the net momentum i am talking about the linear momentum is conserved or it is constant okay fine so if i say that this system has this initial state and the total momentum is pi vector after some time let's say this be the state of the system okay its momentum let's say is pf and in both the cases there wasn't any external force acting on the system fine so the law of conservation of linear momentum says that pi vector must be equal to pf vector okay the individual linear momentums of individual particles can change okay but the net momentum of the whole system of particles is going to remain the same fine so this was the case of law of conservation of linear momentum fine let us talk about a simple case that is if i have got two bodies which is on a frictionless ground its mass is m1 its mass is m2 let me write more cleanly this is my frictionless ground and this is my first body this is my second body its mass is m2 its mass is m1 it has got velocity v1 it has got velocity v2 and v1 is greater than v2 so so that the collision occurs fine now collision occurs 
the force acting on this system is internal in nature there isn't any external force which is acting on the system there are external forces but there isn't any net external force which is acting on the system okay so after collision let's say the state is something like this v1 dash and the velocity of mass m2 is v2 dash okay so the law of conservation of linear momentum states that m1 v1 vector plus m2 v2 vector this is the initial momentum which i had denoted by pi this must be equal to the final total momentum of the system that is m1 v1 dash plus m2 v2 dash okay this is nothing else but pf fine okay now let us talk about collisions okay there are two types of collisions one is elastic collision okay now in case of elastic collision there is no loss of kinetic energy of the system okay no loss of kinetic energy of the system and if the system is under no net external force the linear momentum remains conserved okay let us now talk about no uh, in elastic collision the forces involved in the interaction they are all conservative in nature okay the forces in interaction are conservative in nature okay the mechanical energy in case of elastic collision is not converted into any other form of energy this is something which we need to consider okay and the total energy is conserved the total energy is in fact conserved in case of elastic as well as inelastic collision okay the kinetic energy is conserved in case of elastic collision whereas kinetic energy is not conserved in case of elastic collision the initial kinetic energy gets converted into some form of energy plus the kinetic energy in the final state okay so basically what i want to say is that the some fraction of initial kinetic energy gets converted into some other form of energy in case of inelastic collision so now let us talk about inelastic collisions okay so the momentum linear momentum conserved fine uh there is loss of kinetic energy fine and the forces they are involved they are non conservative in nature some of the forces are non conservative in nature that would be a proper statement some of the forces involved
is non conservative okay and the total energy is constant the total energy of the system is conserved okay in both the cases that is elastic collision as well as inelastic collision okay now let us talk about a situation that is i've got two blocks the first block has got mass m1 the second block has got mass m2 it is traveling with a velocity of v1 the second block is traveling with a velocity of v2 fine where v1 is greater than v2 so that collision occurs after the collision my state is something like this both the blocks are moving in a frictionless surface okay so my final state is this is my first block it has got velocity v1 dash this is my second block it has got velocity v2 dash okay fine so this is a case of elastic collision let's say fine so my kinetic energy and the momentum is going to be conserved i'm going to write down my momentum conservation equation i'll write down m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals m1 v1 dash plus m2 v2 dash this is my first expression okay now in this problem i've got v1 v2 known v1 dash and v2 dash they are unknown quantities m1 m2 is given to me fine so my second equation would be that of the law of conservation of kinetic energy okay that isn't a law actually so i'll write down half m1 v1 square plus half m2 v2 square this must be equal to half m1 v1 dash square plus half m2 v2 dash square okay so this is my second expression on solving these two expressions i'll get the expression of v1 dash and v2 dash in terms of v1 v2 m1 and m2 on solving this we'll get that i'm not solving those equation these equations i'm directly writing down the expressions for v1 dash it is m1 minus m2 into v1 plus 2 m2 v2 upon m1 plus m2 okay this is one thing which we need to remember okay because this is a very general case the questions are generally asked of this case okay and v2 dash is going to be equal to m2 minus m1 into v2 plus 2 m1 v1 upon m1 plus m2 okay these are the two basic formulas which we need to remember now there are going to be few special cases related to this collision okay the first special case being when m1 equals m2 okay so this is my first case when m1 equals m2 in that case if i put in the value of m1 equals m2 in these two expressions i'll get v1 dash as v2 and v2 dash as v1 so in this case we see that the velocities just get interchange the first body of mass m1 after collision attains the velocity of the second body okay before the collision fine this is pretty evident from these two expressions fine now 
um, if my target body is at rest and the masses are the same we see that the the first body comes to rest after collision and the second body attains a velocity equal to that of the first body before the collision okay so if v1 v2 equals 0 we see that v1 dash equals 0 and v2 dash equals v okay where v is the velocity of the first body before the collision and after the collision v2 becomes equal to 0 and v1 dash and uh, after the collision v2 dash becomes equal to v and v1 dash becomes equal to 0 fine now let us move on to the next case that is the second body has a mass negligible as compared to that of A in that case in this case mathematically I'll write M2 is much much less than M1 in this case I'll get V1 dash as V1 and V2 dash as twice of V1 okay so these are few simple uh, deductions which we can make based on these cases okay it would, it would be better if we remember these cases and it would be fine even if we remember the first two formulas okay now let us look at case 3 okay so in the third case m2 is much much greater than m1 in this case we get v1 dash as minus v1 and v2 dash as 0 okay let us not now talk about the elastic collisions in two dimensions so we are going to talk about elastic collision in 2d okay so let's say i have got a body m1 which is moving with a velocity of v1 i've got the second body m2 which is moving with a velocity of v2 where m v1 is greater than v2 after the collision the state is something like this m1 moves in this direction with a velocity of v1 dash and m2 moves in this direction with a velocity of v2 dash this angle is let's say theta 1 this angle is let's say theta 2 okay now if this case is that of elastic collision the there are going to be few equations which we will obtain okay so I'll write down few equations since this system is under no net external force the momentum is going to be conserved the net momentum is going to be conserved okay so if I write down the momentum equation along the x-axis I'll write down m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals m1 v1 dash cos of theta 1 plus m2 v2 dash cos of theta 2 this is the momentum equation along the x-axis along the y-axis I'll write down m1 v1 dash minus m1 v1 dash sin of theta 1 minus m2 v2 dash sin of theta 2 this is basically the final momentum along the y axis this must be equal to 0 since the initial momentum of the system along the y axis was equal to 0 okay fine now since the collision is elastic in nature I'll write down half m1 v1 square plus half m2 v2 square this must be equal to the final kinetic energy m1 v1 dash square plus half m2 v2 dash square okay 
so this is the expression for the kinetic energy okay so this is the way we write down the equations basically we uh, write down the momentum equation we write down the energy equation in case of elastic collision in case of inelastic collision the kinetic energy is not going to be conserved in that case we would be given some other parameters like coefficient of restriction and other stuffs so that we would be able to solve the problem fine so this is the way we write down the equation let us now talk about a case that is perfectly inelastic collision in which the bodies after the collision get stuck to each other fine so if i say that this is my first body it is moving with a velocity of v1 and it is of mass m1 this is my second body it is of mass m2 it is moving with a velocity of v2 and if it is the case of perfectly elast inelastic collision these two bodies will stick together which implies that they will have a common velocity okay and this whole body would have a mass of m1 plus m2 so i'll write down m1 v1 plus m2 v2 must be equal to m1 plus m2 into v okay so this is going to be the case of perfectly in elastic collision so this is the case of perfectly in elastic collision fine now there is going to be some loss of kinetic energy in the system okay because it is the case of inelastic collision so that can easily be found if i consider the if i calculate the final kinetic energy and then subtract it from the initial kinetic energy okay that will give me the loss of kinetic energy now let us define a term called coefficient of restitution the coefficient of restitution is defined as the velocity ratio of velocity of separation upon velocity of approach okay so if i have got two bodies the same case the general case okay they had velocities v1 and v2 in order to collide v1 must be greater than v2 and after the collision this body is moving with a velocity of v2 dash and this body is moving with a velocity of v1 dash okay clearly in order to separate v2 dash must be greater than v1 dash so my coefficient of restitution is defined as v2 dash minus v1 dash upon v1 minus v2 okay so this is basically the velocity of separation and this is basically velocity of approach so this is basically the definition of coefficient of restitution okay so for perfectly inelastic collision the coefficient of restitution is going to be equal to zero and for perfectly elastic collision the coefficient of restitution is going to be equal to 1 so e equals 1 for perfectly elastic collision and e equals 0 for perfectly inelastic collision okay so these are the two things which we need to remember e is always going to be less than or equal to 1 and it is always going to be greater than or equal to 0 okay in all the other cases of in elastic collisions the value of e is going to be a fraction fine let us now talk about a topic which is center of mass i just be giving a, the basic definition of center of mass and few concepts related to center of mass okay uh, so center of mass as such we 
have many physical definitions of center of mass like it is a point where the whole uh, mass of the substance seems to be concentrated but actually the definition of center of mass is completely mathematical so if i have a system of particles let's say this is m1 this is m2 this is m3 okay so i have this system of particles and so on i may have infinitely many number of particles so the center of mass is defined with respect to uh, an origin right so it is basically the position so if i say that this is my origin this is my origin and this is my x axis this is my y axis i am writing down this formula in for a two dimensional system of particles this could be extended to a three dimensional system of particles had i uh, drawn another axis that is the z axis okay so if i say that this particle of mass m1 has got a position vector of r1 this has got a position vector of r2 and this has got a position vector of r3 so the center of masses position is position vector is going to be given by r cm equals m1 r1 vector plus m2 r2 vector plus m3 r3 vector upon m1 plus m2 plus m3 okay so this is how we define the position vector of the center of mass of a system of particles okay this is just a mathematical definition it has got many physical implication but the basic definition of center of mass is purely mathematical okay so this is the mathematical definition of center of mass uh, to be more precise if i extend this definition for n number of particles uh then i'll say that the position of center of mass that is rcm is given by sigma mi ri upon sigma mi where i is from 1 to n okay fine so this is for n number of particles these a uh, definition is for discrete particles okay if i had a continuous body in that case the center of mass is going to have another definition in that case the center of mass is going to be defined as rcm is defined as integral of r vector into dm upon integral of dm okay so if i have got this continuous body so this has got infinitely many number of particles so i'll basically have to integrate it and if i am writing down the formula for center of mass with respect to this origin so the definition turns out to be this okay now this definition generally works better for symmetric bodies right uh, we would be able to find out the center of mass for symmetric bodies pretty easily for unsymmetric bodies or for very random bodies the definition becomes pretty tough okay i mean this this integral becomes pretty tough and it is very tough for us to find out the center of mass of the body okay so these are the two formulas which we need to consider fine now this origin could change anywhere okay but the position of center of mass with respect to the individual particles is going to remain the same with respect to the individual particles but with respect to the origin it may vary okay fine so now let us talk about velocity of center of mass so if i look at this expression rcm is given by sigma mi r i vector upon sigma mi okay if i differentiate on both the sides i'll get vcm equals sigma mi dr i by dt is going to be vi 
upon sigma mi okay so this is going to be the velocity of the center of mass and if i differentiate this expression again i'll get acm differentiate this expression with respect to time i'll get acm equals sigma mi ai vector upon sigma mi okay so this is going to be the acceleration of the center of mass fine okay so these are the few concepts which we need to remember in case of center of mass these are just the basic concepts the further concepts are going to be discussed later okay now let us begin off with few problems in the topic of law of conservation of energy momentum and angular momentum fine so my first problem is this the kinetic energy of a particle moving along a circular path of radius r depends on the distance s as t equals e a square where t is the total kinetic energy where a is a constant determine the force acting on the particle as a function of s fine so in this problem i have a particle which is traveling in a circular path of radius r so let's say this is my circular path and the particle is traveling in a circular path which is of radius r so this is my radius r let's say the particle began moving from this particular point and after traveling a distance of s it is at this particular point and at this particular point the total kinetic energy is given by the expression a s square fine so the total kinetic energy is given by a s square now kinetic energy is given by half m into v square where v is the velocity of the particle at this particular point fine so this is given by a s square fine now at this particular point the particle is going to have two forces one would be tangential force the other one would be radial force the tangential force is let's say represented by ft the radial force which is directed towards the center of the circular path is let's say given by fr fine now ft is nothing else but m into a which is at which is the tangential acceleration which can be written as m into dv by dt okay and fr is nothing else but the centripetal acceleration which is given by m into v square by r okay now from this expression if i differentiate this particular expression with respect to time i'll get d by dt of half m into v square equals d by dt of a square fine so on differentiating it i'll get half into m into 2v into dv by dt equals to a s into ds by dt now what is ds by dt ds by dt is nothing else but the tangential velocity so i can cancel v and ds by dt from the two sides of the equation this two gets cancelled from which i get the tangential acceleration as tangential acceleration which is m into dv by dt as 2a s fine so this is the expression for my tangential acceleration now let us find out the expression for the radial acceleration radius radial axle radial force okay so the centripetal force is given by mv square by r so from this particular expression i can write mv square by r as 2a a square by r okay and mv square by r is nothing else but the radial force or the centripetal force fine now the net force is going to be directed somewhere in this direction which is going to be the resultant of these two forces fr and ft fine so f net is going to be given by fr square plus ft square half okay to the power half uh, if i put in the value of fr and ft i'll get the resultant value of f net as 
I am not solving these pro uh, equations, right? I am directly writing down an answer. I hope that you would be able to solve the expression yourself. So I get f net as 2as into 1 plus s by r whole square whole to the power 1 by 2. So this is the expression of the net force which is acting on the particle after it has traveled a distance of s okay in terms of s fine let us now begin off with the next problem in the topic fine so this is my next problem a body of mass m was slowly hauled up the hill by a force f which at each point was directed along a tangent to the trajectory find the work performed by this force if the height of the hill is h and the length of its base is l and the coefficient of friction is k fine so there are a few points which need to be noted down in this problem the body was hauled slowly which implies that if it had some velocity the velocity wasn't changing right so the body was always in equilibrium fine so let's say at this particular point the slope which this particular point made with the horizontal be of angle theta fine so let's say that is my point and at that particular point the force f is acting due to which the particle traveled a very small displacement dx in that direction fine okay so this is my angle theta and this is my force which the particle is under uh, is subjected to fine so the force at this particular point is going to be given by mg into sine of theta plus k mg into cos of theta since the particle was at equilibrium, be, equilibrium because it was slowly hauled up the hill fine so from that particular statement I have written this expression that the particle was always in equilibrium fine okay now the work done is going to be given by dw which is the small work done at this particular point by this force dw is going to be given by f dotted with dx fine so it can be written as mg into sine of theta plus kmg into cos of theta since f and dx are in the same direction that is the angle between the displacement vector and the force vector is zero so f dotted with dx can be written as f into dx fine so therefore i have written this expression fine dw equals this is f into dx fine so this can again be written as mg into dx sine of theta plus k into dx cos of theta okay this is dw now if this is my dx and this is theta dx sine of theta is going to be nothing else but dh fine which is the small increment in the height and dx cos of theta is nothing else but dl fine so this dw can be written as mg into dx sine theta which is dh plus k times dx cos of theta which is dl 
okay so in order to find out the total work done by this force in order to move the body to the top of the hill i'll just need to integrate okay from c o to w okay and these are two separate integrals so this has to be written as w equals mg into h from 0 to h plus k mg into l from 0 to l okay so w turns out to be mg into h plus k mg into l so w turns out to be mg into h plus k l fine so this is my expression of the work which the force is going to do on the body to reach it to the top of the hill fine now let us move on to the next problem which is this a small body a starts sliding from the height h down an incline groove passing into a half circle of radius h by 2 assuming the friction to be negligible find the velocity of the body at the highest point of its trajectory after breaking off the groove fine so in this problem i have a particle which is initially at this point at height h from the level ground fine now after it has reached the bottommost point it starts moving in a circular groove okay which is of radius h by 2 fine so i need to find out the velocity of the particle at the highest point of its trajectory fine so uh, let's say at this particular point it has some velocity v work okay, fine it would definitely be directed in the rightward direction fine so the velocity velocity is magnitude is going to be obtained from the law of conservation of energy fine so at this particular point it had only potential energy it was initially at rest so at this particular point it had just potential energy and no kinetic energy so mgh would be the potential energy at this particular point all that potential energy got converted into kinetic energy so it had a kinetic energy given by half mv square from which i get the velocity at the bottommost point as root 2gh okay fine now we have uh, theorem in circular motion that if my velocity lies between root 2g r and root of 5g r the particle slacks okay i mean the the string slacks in this case the particle leaves the uh, circular path circular track in the first quadrant let's say this is my circle and at this particular point it had some velocity which was satisfying this particular relation so i'd say that the particle is definitely going to break off the track in the first quadrant somewhere fine so it it is let's say going to break off at this particular point fine so that is something for sure because if i put in the value of r that by h by 2 i'll get v 2g h by 2 2.5 gh okay so this condition is valid for this particular velocity right so the body is definitely going to lose its contact with the circular track in the first quadrant in this case it is going to be somewhere at this particular point after which the particle is going to travel in a projectile path it will travel in this path and at this particular point it is going to have the maximum height okay now i basically now basically now need to find out few angles concerning this particular point at which the particle lost its con lost lost its contact with the circular track okay so let's say this is my situation the angle made by with the horizontal is 
let's say theta okay and at this particular point the velocity which the particle had let's say is v dash and at this particular point it had a velocity of v which is equal to 2 root over 2 gh fine so since the whole path is frictionless right so the energy is going to be conserved so i'll write down half mv square this is the initial kinetic energy this is going to be equal to the potential energy at this particular point and the kinetic energy of the particle at this particular point so the kinetic energy is going to be given by half m into v dash square plus the potential energy is going to be given by this height is going to be h by 2 plus h by 2 sine of theta right so the potential energy turns out to be mg into h by 2 into 1 plus sine theta okay fine so this is let's say my first expression now at this particular point since the particle lost its contact with the circular path i can obtain another expression from that particular condition right so the normal contact force between the particle and the path is going to be equal to zero at this particular point which implies that all the centripetal force which the particle needed to move in a circular path was provided by a component of gravity fine so i'll write down m into v dash square by r this is the centripetal force must be equal to mg into sin of theta okay fine so this is let's say my second expression this mg sin of theta is going to be the uh, component of the weight of the particle in this particular direction that is radially inverse fine so if i solve these two expression i'll get the value of sin theta as sin theta is going to be turn out to be 2 by 3 okay fine now the particle left its contact here after which it is going to move in a projectile path the path is going to be something like this okay this angle is going to be theta okay and this angle is going to be nothing else but 90 degree minus theta and the velocity which the particle is going to have at the highest point is going to be nothing else but v dash into sine of theta that is the horizontal component of the initial velocity of the projectile path okay so initial velocity was v dash the horizontal component is going to be v dash into cos of 90 degree minus theta that is v dash into sine of theta okay now i just need to find out v dash okay fine so v dash can easily be obtained from this particular expression in this particular expression i just need to replace r by h by 2 okay so if i replace r by h by 2 so i'll write down m into v dash square equals mg into r can be replaced by h by 2 into sin theta can be replaced by 2 by 3 okay so m gets cancelled which gives me v dash as root over gh by 3 okay fine so v dash sin theta that is the velocity of the particle at the maximum point of its trajectory is going to be equal to 2 by 3 into root gh by root 3 okay so this is what i had to find out in this problem fine
let us now move on to the next problem which is this a horizontal plane supports a stationary vertical cylinder of radius r and a disc a attached to the cylinder by a horizontal thread ab of length l0 and initial velocity v0 is imparted to the disc as given in the figure so this is my figure okay how long will it move along the plane until it strikes against the cylinder the friction is assumed to be absent fine so in this case i have a string which is tied to the cylinder at this particular point the other end of the string is fixed and uh, the other end of the string is free and uh, uh, i have a particle which is attached to the other end of the string and the particle is imparted a velocity v not okay uh, as shown in the figure this is basically a top view of the setup okay so this is basically my cylinder it is just the top view therefore we are viewing it as a circle fine so definitely the string is going to bound itself around the cylinder i need to find out the time which the particle is going to take to strike the cylinder back which implies that the time which the string is going to take to wound itself completely around the cylinder that is what i need to find out fine so now this is going to be my path of the particle fine so at the any particular point let's say at this state the case is something like this this much string has been wound around the cylinder and this is the length of the string which is still unwound this is my center of this cylinder let's say the angle b theta okay the length of the string wound around the cylinder in this particular state is going to be given by r into theta which is quite obvious this is going to be the length r theta the length of the string which is still unwound is l not minus r theta okay fine now i need to look into few conditions in this particular problem fine this string is inextensible which implies it cannot break okay from the setup it is pretty clear that the string is not slacking the string is always taut which implies that the tension in the string is always going to be perpendicular to the velocity at any instance of time fine so if this is my string and this is my tension the velocity is always going to be perpendicular now if the velocity and the tension the force is always perpendicular okay the velocity perpendicular to the string is never going to change okay it is pretty straight forward if this is my velocity and if this is my force the magnitude of the velocity in this particular direction is never going to change right the velocity magnitude at max can change in this particular direction okay fine so from which i can say that the velocity perpendicular to the tension at any instance of time is never going to change fine so the velocity remains v not all the time i now just need to find out the distance which the particle travel that is this particular distance of the path okay fine so at this particular instance small distance ds can be written as del not minus r theta into d theta where d theta is the small angular displacement okay fine okay so i just need to integrate this this is going to be integrated from 0 to s and this has to be integrated from 0 to l not by r okay fine so i've written l not by r because that is the total 
angle which the particle is going to make finally with this center that would be basically be the total angular displacement which the particle is going to make around the cylinder okay so if i integrate it s turns out to be l not into l not by r minus r into theta square by 2 if i replace theta by l not by r square by 2 so this turns out to be l not square by 2r so this is my s fine so the time which by the particle to strike the cylinder is going to be equal to s by v naught so it turns out to be l naught square by 2 r v naught okay so this is going to be the time which the particle is going to take to strike the cylinder back okay now let us begin off with few problems in the topic of law of conservation of energy momentum and angular momentum fine so my first problem is this the kinetic energy of a particle moving along a circular path of radius r depends on the distance s as t equals e a square where t is the total kinetic energy where a is a constant determine the force acting on the particle as a function of s fine so in this problem i have a particle which is traveling in a circular path of radius r so let's say this is my circular path and the particle is traveling in a circular path which is of radius r so this is my radius r let's say the particle began moving from this particular point and after traveling a distance of s it is at this particular point and at this particular point the total kinetic energy is given by the expression a s square fine so the total kinetic energy is given by a s square now kinetic energy is given by half m into v square where v is the velocity of the particle at this particular point fine so this is given by a s square fine now at this particular point the particle is going to have two forces one would be tangential force the other one would be radial force the tangential force is let's say represented by ft the radial force which is directed towards the center of the circular path is let's say given by fr fine now ft is nothing else but m into a which is at which is the tangential acceleration which can be written as m into dv by dt okay and fr is nothing else but the centripetal acceleration which is given by m into v square by r okay now from this expression if i differentiate this particular expression with respect to time i'll get d by dt of half m into v square equals d by dt of a square fine so on differentiating it i'll get half into m into 2v into dv by dt equals to a s into ds by dt now what is ds by dt ds by dt is nothing else but the tangential velocity so i can cancel v and ds by dt from the two sides of the equation this two gets cancelled from which i get the tangential acceleration as tangential acceleration which is m into dv by dt as 2a s fine so this is the expression for my tangential acceleration now let us find out the expression for the radial acceleration radius radial axel, radial force okay so the centripetal force is given by mv square by r so from this particular expression i can write mv square by r as 2a 
a square by r okay and mv square by r is nothing else but the radial force or the centripetal force fine now the net force is going to be directed somewhere in this direction which is going to be the resultant of these two forces fr and fd fine so f net is going to be given by fr square plus fd square half okay to the power half uh, if i put in the value of fr and fd i'll get the resultant value of f net as i'm not solving these pro uh, equations right i'm directly writing down the answer i hope that you would be able to solve the expression yourself so i get f net as 2 as into 1 plus s by r whole square whole to the power 1 by 2 so this is the expression of the net force which is acting on the particle after it has traveled a distance of s okay in terms of s fine let us now move on to the next problem which is this a stationary pulley carries a rope whose one end supports a ladder with a man and the other end the counterweight of mass capital m the ma the man of mass small m climbs up the ladder l dash climbs up a distance l dash with respect to the ladder and then stops neglecting the mass of the rope and the friction in the pulley and axle fine the displacement i of the center of inertia of the system so in this case i have a pulley which is ideal and it is fixed so this is my fixed pulley and there is an ideal string which bounds over the pulley and one end of the string is attached to a ladder the other end is attached to a counterweight capital m a man of small uh, of my small m is on the ladder okay now for a timing let's say that all the three bodies are at the same level this is being done just to simplify the problem because basically i need just need to find out the displacement of the center of inertia of the system in the final state fine so this capital m is the counterweight fine so that would imply that the mass of the ladder is capital m minus small m fine because the two sides of the pulley are in equilibrium at each and every instance of time now let me draw the final state in the final state let's say that the man moved up by a distance of x1 and the ladder moved down by a distance of x2 okay so the center of mass of the ladder is at a distance x2 below the reference level now this point moved down by a distance of x2 which implies that this point of this string is going to move up by a distance of x2 which would imply that capital m has moved up by a distance of x2 now i can easily find out the new position of the center of inertia fine so the new position would be m into x1 considering this as my positive okay so m into x1 plus capital m into x2 minus capital m minus small m into x2 upon m minus m this is for the ladder plus mass of the man plus the counterweight so this is x cm dash okay so this turns out to be mx1 plus capital m x2 minus capital m x2 plus 
m x two small m x two upon two m. Okay, so this turns out to be small m into x one plus x two upon two m. Now I've been given that the man moved a distance of l dash with respect to the ladder, which implies that l dash is the relative displacement of the man with respect to the ladder and the relative displacement of the man with respect to the ladder is nothing else but this whole distance which has been given to me as l dash which is nothing else but x1 plus x2 right so i can replace x1 plus x2 by l dash okay so this gives me x cm dash as m into small m into l dash upon 2m okay x initial x cm initial cm initial was equal to 0 right this was my reference state and the x cm initial was at y equals 0 xcm final is at ml dash upon 2m so the displacement of the center of inertia is nothing else but xcm dash okay so this is going to be the displacement of the center of inertia fine let us now move on to the next problem which is this two bars of masses small m1 and small m2 connected by a weightless spring of stiffness x rest on a smooth horizontal plane bar 2 is shifted a small distance x to the left and then released find the velocity of the center of inertia of the system after bar 1 breaks off the wall fine so in this problem this is my setup and the wall surface is frictionless i have a spring which is having a stiffness constant of x this bar of mass m2 is shifted in the leftward direction okay so my initial state is something like this this is my displacement x okay so this bar 2 is shifted by a dis distance of x in the leftward direction bar m1 is going to move is going to leave the contact with this wall when there is stretching in the spring when the, the stretching in the spring is about to begin fine during that whole period the energy is going to be conserved basically what is going to happen is that this spring is going to apply a force on bar 2 in the rightward direction it is also going to apply a force on bar m1 in the leftward direction which is going to be balanced by the normal force which would be provided by the wall okay so this bar 1 is not going to move until there is some stretching in the spring fine so during the whole period the bar of mass m2 is going to move in the rightward direction fine it will reach a state where the spring would be unstretched after that the stretching in the spring would tend to begin due to which the bar of mass m1 is going to leave the contact with the wall fine so during that whole period the energy is conserved let's say in the final state this bar of mass m2 is having a velocity v in the rightward direction fine so since the energy is conserved, I'll write half into x into x square, which is the initial potential energy which was stored in the spring because of the compression in the spring. This
must be equal to the final kinetic energy of m2 when the stretching is just about to begin into v square fine so this gives me a value of v as x cube upon m2 to the power half okay fine so I need to find out the velocity of the center of inertia. The velocity of the center of inertia is going to be m2 into v plus m1 into 0 because initially when the bar of mass m1 is about to lose contact with the wall it is going to have 0 velocity upon m1 plus m2. Okay. So this gives me VCM as M2 into X cube upon M2 to the power half upon M1 plus M2. Okay. So VCM turns out to be x into x m2 to the power half upon m1 plus m2 okay so this is going to be the velocity of the center of mass of the system when the bar of mass m1 is about to lose contact with the wall let's now move on to the next problem which is this a small bar a resting on a smooth horizontal plane is attached by threads to a point P and by means of a weightless pulley to a weight B possessing the same mass as the bar itself. Besides the bar is also attached to a point O by means of light non-deformed spring of length L0 equals 50 cm and stiffness X equals 5 mg upon L0 where M is the mass of the bar the thread PA having The thread PA having been burned, the bar starts moving. Find the velocity at the moment when it is breaking off the plane. Fine. So in this problem, I have this setup. Okay. This is my spring. It has a spring constant x which is given by 5 mg upon L0. And uh, L0 is the length of the spring. And m is the mass of bar A and bar B MA equals MB equals M ok they have the same mass I now need to find out the velocity of the individual bars at the moment when bar A is about to break off the plane this is my thread which was burned due to which the system started moving okay so let me draw the state when the bar A is about to lose contact with the plane this is my bar B of mass M this is my bar A of mass M and definitely my spring has stretched by some distance so this is my spring let's say it now makes an angle of theta with the vertical initially it had length L0 in this particular case it has a length L0 into sec of theta okay so the spring basically has stretched fine there is going to be some tension in the string okay fine now this 
by A is about to lose contact with the plane which implies that the vertical force is acting the net vertical force acting on by A is going to be equal to zero fine so I'll write down X into the stretching in the spring that is L naught into sec theta minus L naught that is L naught into sec of theta minus 1 into cos of theta right so this is the direction of the spring force its vertical component is this into cos of theta so this is actually the vertical component of the force of the spring force okay this must be equal to the mass this must be equal to the weight of the bar a okay so this is let's say my first expression fine okay if i put in the value of x as 5 mg upon l naught i'll get cos theta as if i put in the value of x as 5 mg upon l naught in this particular expression i'll get my value of cos theta as 4 by 5 okay fine now this is the distance which bar a moved this must also be the vertical distance which bar b moved okay let's say it is x naught okay so i can write down x naught by l naught equals tan of theta and tan theta is nothing else but 3 by 5 3 by 4 okay so that implies x naught equals 3 by 4 l naught okay fine now this whole surface was frictionless the strings are idle the pulley is idle the spring is also idle fine so the total energy is going to be conserved fine so at this particular instance the final instance let's say bar b had a velocity v in the vertically downward direction and bar a had velocity v in the horizontal direction okay now the work done by the weight act of bar m is going to be equal to mg into x naught okay this is actually the work done on the system this must be equal to the kinetic energy of the two bodies that is half into m into v square plus half into m into v square plus some amount of potential energy which is stored in the spring so that is half into x into the stretching square that is l naught into sec theta minus 1 that is 5 by 4 minus 1 square okay so i can write mg into x naught now x naught can be written as 3 by 4 l naught must be equal to mv square plus half into 5 by 4 sorry x was equal to 5 mg upon l naught into 
L naught square by 16 okay so this is going to give me the value of V as root over 19 by 32 G L naught okay this on solving is going to give me the value of V as root over 19 by 32 G L naught if I put in the value of L naught as 50 centimeter I'll get the value of V as 1.7 meters per second okay I hope the con concept is pretty clear I didn't solve the equation I just need to solve this particular expression in order to obtain the expression for V as this okay and after putting L naught equals 50 centimeters I'll get this answer fine let us now move on to the next problem which is this a pulley fixed to the ceiling carries a thread with bodies of mass M1 and M2 attached to its ends fine the masses of the pulley and the thread is negligible find the acceleration WC of the center of inertia of the system so in this case I have a fixed pulley and a thread is wound over the pulley okay the two masses are M1 and M2 I need to find out the acceleration WC of the center of inertia of the system fine so the acceleration of this mass M1 and M2 is simply going to be equal to M1 minus M2 into G upon M1 plus M2 this is pretty clear I hope because these are this is pretty simple evaluation okay so the mass of the mass M2 is going to move upward with an acceleration of M1 minus M2 upon M1 plus M2 into G okay I, na I now need to find out the acceleration of the moment acceleration of the center of inertia of the system fine so AC if I take uh, downward as positive I'll write down AC is going to be equal to M1 into M1 minus M2 into G upon M1 plus M2 that is M1 A1 minus plus M2 A2 since A2 is directed in the vertically upward direction I'll write down minus M2 into M1 minus M2 into G upon M1 plus M2 okay this whole divided by M1 plus M2 okay so this is going to be the acceleration of the center of inertia of the system so on solving this turns out to be M1 minus M2 upon M1 plus M2 whole square into G okay so this is going to be the acceleration of the center of inertia of the system fine let's now move on to the next problem which is this two bars of masses m1 and m2 connected by a non-deformed light spring rests on a horizontal surface the coefficient of friction between the bars and the surface is equal to k what minimum constant force has to be applied in the horizontal bar to the in the horizontal direction to the bar of mass m1 in order to shift the other bar fine so basically i need to find out the minimum value of force f which needs to be applied on bar of mass m1 such that bar of mass m2 just begins to move fine now when will the bar of mass m2 just begin to move when there is some extension in the spring such that the spring for applies a spring uh, applies a force of magnitude equal to the maximum amount of friction force which the ground can apply on bar of mass m2 fine now let us draw the final situation of the block and spring system fine Let's say this is my final situation. The bar M2 is still at rest. 
it is just about to move fine but it is still at rest and it hasn't moved at all the bar m1 has moved a distance let's say x which implies that the spring also has undergone an extension of x fine okay now let's say that in this final situation the bar m1 has a velocity let's say v this bar of mass m2 is going to have zero velocity velocity still initially these two bars were having no velocities at all fine now mu into the extension this is going to be the spring force which the spring is going to apply on the block of mass m2 fine this must be equal to this must be equal to the maximum amount of frictional force which the ground can apply on the bar of mass m2 fine so this must be equal to k into m2 into g okay so this is let's say my first equation now i can apply the work energy theorem that is the total amount of work done by the system uh, on the system must be equal to the increase in the potential energy of the system and uh, the kinetic energy of the system in in actual terms what i should be saying is that the total amount of work done on the system must be equal to the uh, change in the kinetic energy of the system fine so in this case the work done by the spring force is negative uh, so if i bring that negative term on the rhs it will turn out to be positive and that i am calling as the energy stored in the spring as in the form of potential energy fine so if i write down the work energy theorem the positive work which is done on the system is going to be plus f into x this is the positive work done the negative work done by the frictional force is minus uh, k into m1 into g into x and the work done by the spring force is negative in this case since the force and the displacement is negative so i shall actually be writing minus half into mu into x square this must be equal to sorry this must be equal to half into m1 into v square this is the change in the kinetic energy of the system fine so if i shift the terms properly fx turns out to be k into m1 into g into x plus half mu x square plus half into m1 into v square now it is pretty much clear that the value of x is fixed the value of k m1 g everything is fixed for minimum value of f what i must have is v should be equal to zero that is for minimum value of f m1 should finally be at rest okay so v must be equal to zero for minimum value of f okay for f min okay so this gives me the value of f as k m1 g plus half into mu x now i know that mu x is equal to k into m2 into g okay so this gives me f min as k this should be the minimum okay k into m1 g plus half into mu into x is going to be k m2 into g okay so this gives me f min as kg into k into g into m1 plus half m2 okay so this is going to be the minimum value of force which needs to be applied on the block of mass m1 such that the block of mass m2 just starts moving fine let us now move on to the next problem which is this 
पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम वन कोलाइड्स इलास्टिकली विद स्टेशनरी पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम टू वे एम वन इज ग्रेटर दैन एम टू फाइंड द मैक्सिम एंगल थ्रू विच द स्ट्राइकिंग पार्टिकल मे डेविएट एज अ रिजल्ट ऑफ द कोलिजन सो इन दिस प्रॉब्लम आई हैव अ पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम वन इट स्ट्राइक्स इलास्टिकली अ स्टेशनरी पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम टू ओके इनिशियली लेट से इट हैड मोमेंटम पी वन ओके इन द हॉरिजेंटल डायरेक्शन आफ्टर द कोलिजन लेट से पार्टिकल वन ऑफ मास एम वन मूव्स इन दिस पर्टिकुलर डायरेक्शन विथ अ मोमेंटम गिवेन बाई पी वन डैश ओके एंड द पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम टू लेट से मूव्स इन दिस डायरेक्शन विथ अ मोमेंटम पी टू डैश ओके फाइन इनिशियली द पार्टिकल ऑफ मास एम टू वॉज स्टेशनरी सो इट डिड नॉट हैव एनी मोमेंटम इन दॉरिजेंटल डायरेक्शन आई जिस आई जस्ट नीड टू फाइंड आउट दिस एंगल थीटा मैक्सिम वैल्यू आई नीड टू फाइंड आउट थीटा मैक्स दैट इज द मैक्सिम एंगल ऑफ डेविएशन विच इज पॉसिबल फॉर मास एम वन टू डेविएट आफ्टर द कोलिजन फाइन सो माई फर्स्ट इक्वेशन विच आर बी राइटिंग इज that of the momentum conservation so i'll write down p1 equals p1 dash plus p2 dash so this is my first equation okay so this can be written as p1 vector minus p1 bar vector equals P2 bar vector. Okay, if I take modulus on both the sides and square it up, I'll get P1 square plus P1 bar square plus sorry minus 2P1. P1 bar cos of theta equals P2 dash square. Okay, so where P1, P1 dash and P2 dash they are modulus of the individual momentum vectors. Okay, so let's say this is my second equation. Okay, now since the collision is elastic, my total kinetic energy is going to going to be conserved. So I'll write down p1 square by 2m1 must be equal to p1 bar square upon 2m1 plus p2 bar square upon 2 m2. Okay, so this is the equation relating the conservation of kinetic energy in case of elastic collision so let's say this is my third equation fine so if i just substitute p2 dash square as this in this expression okay i'll get p1 square upon m1 Must be equal to p1 dash square upon m1 plus p1 square plus p1 dash square minus 2 p1 p1 dash cos of theta upon m2. Okay, fine. So on solving. This equation becomes p1 square into one minus m2 by m1 plus p1 dash square one plus m2 by m1 
माइनस टू पी वन पी वन डैश कॉस ऑफ थीटा इक्वल्स जीरो ओके सो दिस इज अ क्वाड्रेटिक फॉर पी वन डैश ओके फाइन सो दिस इज अ क्वाड्रेटिक फॉर पी वन डैश फॉर अ रियल वैल्यू ऑफ पी वन डैश फॉर रियल पी वन डैश द determinant the discriminant should be greater than zero so this implies for p1 square cos square theta minus for p1 square into 1 minus m2 by m1 square should be greater than equal to zero okay gets cancelled this gives me cos square theta minus 1 plus m2 by m1 whole square greater than equal to zero this gives me sin square theta should be less than equal to m2 by m1 whole square this implies the maximum value of theta is going to be equal to sin inverse m2 by m1 okay so this is my result fine let us now move on to the next problem which is this a particle of mass m1 experienced a perfectly elastic collision with a stationary particle of mass m2 what fraction of the kinetic energy does the striking particle loses if it recoils at right angles to its original motion direction okay so in this problem i have a particle of mass m1 which collides elastically with a stationary particle of mass m2 okay fine so let's say it had an initial momentum of p1 vector after collision it has been said that the first particle deviates perpendicularly the second particle let's say deviates towards this direction fine and let's say the angle which it makes with the horizontal that is the initial motion direction of the particle one is theta okay let's say the first particle after collision has a momentum of p1 dash and the second particle has a momentum p2 dash okay fine my first equation is going to be that of momentum conservation so i'll write down p1 dash p1 must be equal to p1 dash plus p2 dash okay so this is my first equation this can be written as p1 i cap must be equal to p1 dash j cap plus p2 dash cos of theta i cap minus p2 dash sin of theta j cap okay now if i compare the coefficients i'll get i'll get p1 dash is equal to p2 dash sin of theta so let's say this is my second equation and p1 equals p2 
dash cos of theta let's say this is my third equation fine if I divide these two equations that is the second equation and the third equation no if I don't if I if I just replace uh, p2 dash by p1 dash if I if I just replace p2 dash by uh, by p1 dash by cos of theta I'll get p1 dash equals p1 tan of theta okay so let's say this is my fourth expression okay now since the collision is elastic I can conserve my energy I'll write down p1 square by 2 m1 must be equal to p1 dash square upon 2 m1 plus p2 dash square upon 2m2 okay so I can write down p1 square upon 2m1 equals p1 tan of theta square by 2m1 plus p1 square sorry plus p2 dash square upon 2m2 okay this if simplified becomes p2 dash by 2m2 equals p1 square by 2m1 minus p1 square tan square theta upon 2m1 okay let's say this is my equation 5 fine now let us say that eta is my fraction of loss of kinetic energy so eta would be equal to p1 square by 2m1 minus p1 dash square upon 2m1 by p1 square by 2m1 okay so so this uh, expression becomes so my expression becomes 1 minus p1 dash upon p1 square so this can be written as 1 minus tan square theta okay now on uh, solving equation 4, 5 and on solving expression 4 and 5 and 3 I'll get my value of tan square theta as m2 into m2 minus m1 upon m2 plus m1 into m1 okay now I just need to put in the value of tan square theta here in order to get eta okay so eta turns out to be m2 
plus m1 into m1 minus m2 m2 minus m1 upon m1 m2 plus m1 okay fine so this turns out to be m1 square minus m2 square plus 2 m1 m2 upon m1 into m2 plus m1 okay so this is the fraction of kinetic energy which the first particle loses after collision with the second particle fine